Hello, today is February 10th, 2012. We're meeting today with Mr. Dave Suttoth at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Dave, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. It's my pleasure. Wonderful. No one's ever asked me. <laughs> Good. Well, let's start off, if we can. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you're born, a little bit about your family. Oh, okay. I'd be glad to. Well, I was born way back in March of 1950 and born in West Texas in a small town called Brownfield, Texas, in a big dust storm. <laughs> And my, as far as my family is concerned, my wife, Anne, and I have two children, grown children. Well, well, actually, we'll talk about that family, the tail end of the interview. Talk a little oh, about your family growing oh, up, brothers oh, and sisters, your folks. Oh, my uh, goodness. Yeah. Wow. Okay, well, uh, my uh, father, Doyle Southeth, uh, he was actually a Navy veteran, and my mom, uh, Luana, and they were uh, married until I was... 10 years old and there was a divorce mm -hmm. and we had, I have had two siblings at that time, an older brother, Alan, and a younger sister, Ruth. And my mother was remarried when I was 10 and uh, probably five years later we had a Laura, uh, who was my half sister, and my stepdad, uh, Bill, his last name was Chansey. And he was actually an army veteran, but his uh, occupation was uh, education. He was a principal, elementary school principal, and my mother was also an elementary school teacher. And we moved around a, a fair amount. Uh, we, uh, it seemed like about every two years we'd move to a different location, primarily in Oklahoma and Colorado. Due to your parents' uh, careers, or what? Uh, yeah, pretty much yeah. that. Uh, and prior to my mom' uh, divorce when I was ten, we also moved around quite a bit, and mainly in Texas and Oklahoma. Okay. And so then, where'd you end up uh, graduating from high school? Okay. Well, uh, it's a town uh, that's no longer there. The name of the town is Uravan, and it was a Union Carbide Company town. And it was uh, actually involved a lot with the Manhattan Project as far as uranium was concerned. And probably, maybe, it's probably been maybe 10 years ago, uh, it was declared a super fund site. So they had to go in and clean it up and that included uh, completely dismantling the town, changing the course of the nearby river. But uh, So I, I guess I no longer have a hometown. Yeah, right, right. Uh, and the school, the high school I went to was a nearby high school that kind of consolidated the small communities there, and it was uh, Nucla High School. Okay. And I think the Nucla somehow came from nuclear. Yeah, right. So this is a south, what, southwest Colorado? Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. Yes, okay. yes, it's probably 120 miles southwest of Grand Junction. Right, right. Okay. And that's about the largest town or city in that area. <laughs> so, uh, graduated from high school, where did you go from there then? Um, oh, okay. Well, I graduated in 1968. Yeah. And was you know very involved in high school mm -hmm. uh, as far as you know honor society student council. Uh, I think I finished uh, uh, fifth in my class, but there were only fifty five of us for a small high school. And uh, I received a scholarship to go to uh, to college, and it, uh, at that time it was Colorado State College, which is now UNC. Okay. Really. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went there for one semester. And I became a little bit disillusioned with the direction I was taking. I, I think I made my first C in, uh, in school. And I, I guess I was uh, dealing with a lot of things as far as you know, what I wanted to do. And uh, at that time, the, the Vietnam War was, was right. very active. Right. And I had some friends that had gone to, to Vietnam. And there were some other circumstances uh, as far as my brother was, was eligible to go and he had a family and by me enlisting and uh, well, volunteering uh, for the draft, I guess, uh, that would prevent him from having to go to Vietnam. Uh, 
So that was another factor. But is, is that one of the reasons that you? Yeah, that was really one of, oh, uh, wow. of, of a number of factors. Wow. Mm. So I joined the, the Army, and by doing that I could uh, well, avoid the draft, and also what went along with the draft, or, uh, if you're going to Vietnam you would probably be in the infantry or a door gunner in a Huey helicopter or who knows what else. So it did give me a little flexibility. So I did join. Now, yes. sorry to interrupt, but no, why no. did you choose that ar the Army over the other service branches? Um, I'm not sure if there was a good reason for mm. that. Um, I, I know there had been an Army recruiter at the school, or I'd been, uh, uh, I guess, exposed to, and that may have had some effect on it. Okay. But that, uh, other than that, that was about the reason behind the decision. Okay. Okay. So you're over in Greeley. Did you quit, drop out of school after that first semester or take some time off? Or No, uh, it was pretty, uh, uh, because I went to Greeley the fall semester mm -hmm. and, you know, that ended in, in December. Mm -hmm. So I joined uh, at the end of that month. Oh, really? So oh, there wow. wasn't a whole lot of in between. Yeah, that. yeah. And then how soon then thereafter did you ship off then for uh, for boot camp? Or? Well, let's see. I It was fairly soon after that because I went to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, and that's where I took my basic training. And it was a little, uh, because I knew that my final destination would be Vietnam. Mm. And to be in Fort Lewis in the winter time, it didn't really reflect what I would probably see. <laughs> right, Vietnam. right, yeah, right. But it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, I was going to say it was a great experience going to boot camp, but it was not that. Well, but it was I, I, interesting. How, how was that transition from, from civilian life to military life well, for you? I lost a lot of hair. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. For sure. Uh, and it was really a, a maturing uh, experience because of the things we, we had to deal with and very, very disciplined, which wasn't the case in going to college. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that was a bit of a shock, but I, but I think it was a good experience. Uh, it was um, um, I. I maturing, I guess, because uh, in a lot of uh, team types of activities that were, were important. So certainly uh, uh, a lot of camaraderie in that type mm -hmm. of environment because we're all going through a very uh, kind of stressful environment. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was good and I actually received a promotion during uh, basic training, which is a little bit unusual. But uh, after my basic training, I received orders to go to, for my advanced training, to go to Fort Eustis, Virginia. And that's uh, near uh, Newport News, uh, Hampton Roads, uh, so pretty much across the country. Yeah, right, yeah. For sure. And my, my assignment there was to learn to be a... Um, a coxswain on a an army vessel, which was a little bit unusual. So I was in Fort Eustis, Virginia, for about five months in in training there, and the the training included three courses of about at least a couple of months apiece. And the first one was uh, seaman training, in other words, about all about the water, uh, the boats. Uh, the army had actually had a fleet of, of vessels, and the type that I was trained on was what they call a, an LCM, or a landing craft uh, mechanized, and it's, it's, a, it's a vessel that's, uh, say, 75 foot long and about 30 foot wide, and it's a lot like you would see the landing craft uh, Normandy, mm -hmm, but, but mm -hmm. only a little, right. little upgraded from then. So we trained on these uh, LCMs, or as we call them, Mike boats, for uh, for five or six months. Now, sorry to interrupt again. Sure. How did how did you get into that? Was it uh, through testing? Did you uh, sign up for that, or how did you end up? Uh, well, I think it, it was uh, it was not infantry. It was not a not a door gunner on a Huey helicopter. And it was uh, sort of in demand at the time. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, and I had not specified anything, um, uh, I 
your specifics. So, right, right. So that's uh, what I was selected for, and it was um, actually I enjoyed the training. We uh, again there was the seaman training, then there was a, a crew member training, and then because of my I guess performance in those two, then I went on, and it was probably ten percent of the the students that went on to to actually be the uh, coxswain or the operator of the, the vessel, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which uh, which was uh, even, I guess it was very interesting to me sure. because of the things that we learned about navigation and buoys and reading charts and and uh, at the same time with a little bit of uh, warfare involved in, in that type of uh, uh, operation, we would... Uh, not only train on the mic boats, but we would also train on uh, Army tugboats, uh, which again was kind of interesting because I didn't know the Army had tugboats yeah, right, yeah. or, or even rowboats. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, we, uh, some of the training that we did was uh, in the James River near Jamestown in Williamsburg, so a lot of uh, historical things in that area. And we would train by going out to the middle of the James River and the James River at that time had a number of uh, Liberty ships from World War II that were anchored and kind of mothballed mm -hmm. in the middle of the James River. So we would do a lot of our practicing as far as running into things with, with those ships out there. So the primary job of these ships was to unload an, uh, equipment, uh, personnel and, and supplies from offshore to, to shore? Or what? Right. Okay. Uh, well, uh, with the mic boats, that was their primary function: is is transportation of supplies, or troops, or uh, any number of things that you needed in support of infantry divisions okay. or other transportation companies. Uh, logistics was the the main function of the company that I was trained with. Okay. Um, so with that, after. Um, after my advanced training, then that's when you actually get your orders to go to Vietnam, specifically where you're going, what you're going to be doing, and you would be assigned to a what they call a, a medium boat company. Okay, so at that point you weren't assigned anything. You were more or less going over as a replacement, or uh... right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, after the training, the the three courses, then they would, uh, based on how you did and they would then give you orders for your next assignment, okay. which was uh, a certain area within Vietnam. Okay. Um, so at the end of the, the advanced training, you received a, a, a leave to return home mm -hmm. before you went to Vietnam. So that was, I believe, about a two-week period, well, maybe three-week period. So I returned back to uh, uh, to Southwest Colorado for that period of time, and and of course uh, a lot of friends and a lot of family, and they were all, you know, I mean I've been in communication with them during the advanced training, not in basic training, but in advanced training when we had the opportunity to write letters and so mm -hmm, forth. Mm -hmm. So they were all aware of of um, the orders I had to go to Vietnam and a certain date that I had to go from Denver to, in this case, uh, Oakland. That would be the departure time, our place. Uh, and about three days before I was to report to go to Denver to Oakland, I had actually received orders rescinding my, I received orders to rescind my assignment to go to Vietnam. Oh, wow. And. <laughs> another decision point for me. And by this time, everyone was aware I was going to Vietnam, my friends, my mm -hmm, family. Mm -hmm. And there was some strange uh, feeling of, of pride in going over there. Oh, wow. And again, some of the uh, reasons that I went was, or I wanted to go to Vietnam, was a little bit about my brother yeah. and his family. Wow. So I, uh, I put those orders in my pocket and didn't do anything about them. <laughs> so I went to Denver, took the flight to to Oakland, and from Oakland we departed to Anchorage, then to Honolulu, the Wake Islands, uh, Guam, 
and then into Cameron Bay in Vietnam. And uh, we were uh, in uniform and, and all of that, uh, our fatigues, uh -huh. uh, you know, during that whole process. So I had tucked those orders away. Oh. <laughs> Just in case I get over, no, really, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know I had got, but it was, uh, uh, and, and not many people know that until now. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the flight over is on a United Airlines flight, uh, of course it was all GIs there, and, uh, and when we landed in Cameron Bay, it was so quiet on that plane. It was just dead, dead silence. There were probably 200 uh, all army. On there. What, what, I guess going through, what goes through a person's mind like that? I mean, I've, I've never been anywhere near a, a combat situation. And in, I think through probably report, news reports and such, you probably had a general idea what it was going to be like. but. Uh, I mean, you're basically flying into harm's way. I mean, that long flight, there probably is a lot of time to sit and just sit back and think, <laughs> and you know. And contemplate and, and talk to your yeah. neighbors. And, yeah. So there was, there was a lot of that. But I think the thing that struck me, in a lot of conversations along the way, and, and the, the flight attendants and, you know, uh, crew was all you know, very, very nice to us mm -hmm. and things like that. You know, extra food and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But when we landed, it was so, so quiet, right. and very somber feeling. Um, and that first, uh, well, we flew into Cameron Bay because that's a that was a large processing uh, center for not only Army, Navy, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> I think we got in there probably mid to late morning, and a lot of, you know, paperwork and issuing. What, what time of year was this when you guys uh, came? That would have been in August of 69. 60, yeah. That's and what, physically, what it was like getting off the plane. I've heard uh, many times guys open the door, it was like walking out of, into a sauna it or, was. yeah. It, it, it was, and, and the smells were very, uh, very um, impactful, I guess. Um, and just the scenery, of course, you know, coming from Colorado. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cameron Bay is obviously right on the, it's the South China Sea, I think. So, so we spent most of that day just processing, and then uh, in the evening, you know, we had food, and then we were assigned uh, barracks, a place to sleep. And at this point, nothing's come up that your, your orders have changed? They No. <laughs> I went through that whole process, and there was no record of what I had in my pocket. <laughs> It may have been, but it, I guess it didn't surprise me a little because, you know, just the, I wouldn't say chaotic, but uh, hectic, yeah. rushing this and that. So it did, I always wondered about that, but yeah. still do. Maybe <laughs> I could be a trouble. Uh, but that night, uh, we, uh, we actually, there was a rocket and mortar attack. And, and that wasn't all that... Um, uh, rare there because yeah. it was a, a big base, right. but it was it was it was unusual for me, and and we had to evacuate our barracks and get into bunkers and all of that, and that's when I was really trying to well, I was really rethinking my decision. <laughs> uh, but from that point on, I think we were there a couple of days, but but that night was uh, an explanation point for sure. Because I knew that, you know, we had seen things on TV and yeah. heard a lot of things read in the paper, but that's when it really kind of came home to me. Yeah, right. Oh, boy. <clears throat> uh, after a couple of days there, then, uh, because we received our assignments, specific assignments, in this case, to a, a transportation company. And uh, that, that location that I was, I had to, we took a... Um, an Air Force cargo plane from uh, Cameron Bay into Saigon. And from Saigon, we, uh, we took a uh, helicopter. Uh, actually, it was a Huey, so I got to see in real life and feel and hear. Yeah. Uh, you know, there were maybe five or six of us in this helicopter, and there were door gunners on both sides. It just the sound of a Huey helicopter and taking off and 
just hearing the noises and, and seeing these guys you know, do the work that they needed to do. And we flew from Saigon to, uh, uh, to where my first station was in, it was called Vung Tau. And it was actually on the coast uh, with the South China Sea there. And historically, it, it was uh, what they call the French Riviera of Southeast Asia because a beautiful, beautiful area, mm. uh, somewhat spoiled by the war. Uh, you, as we flew over some of the beaches, you could see the, you wouldn't see a lot of people on the beach, but, but a lot of um, uh, concertina wire and you know, razor wire and things like that, you know, guard towers and mm -hmm. so forth. So that was my uh, first assignment there, and it was to a, a medium boat company, so we had uh, night boats there. Um, and our first assignment there was to actually um, repaint some of the mic boats because at that point in time there was a move to to turn uh, equipment and things like that over to the to the uh, South Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. That changed a little later. <laughs> uh, so our first assignment was to take the mic boats that were part of the company and other transportation company. Uh, which were, uh, you know, camouflage. You know, they had a lot of uh, uh, homemade structures on them where the crew was. Uh, they had, they were well armed. They, they had uh, 50 caliber, caliber machine guns on both sides. They had a M60 machine gun up on top of kind of a homemade hooch, which was your, your home. So, did you guys actually live on the boats, or did you have a base that? Well, uh, okay. that, uh, it, it depended. Okay. If you were assigned to, to the boat, then you would run missions, in this case, up and down from Vung Tau into the Mekong Delta, which was, was south of there. But at this time, given what we were mm -hmm. doing, we were uh, converting mm -hmm. those mic boats mm -hmm. that were, I guess, combat ready and uh, uh, well suited for those types of missions into um, taking all of that off and then repainting the boat. So I did that for probably two months and then I was assigned to a boat. And I think the, uh, uh, you know, as far as getting those ready for the Vietnamese uh, during that process, I think there were some, some changes and uh, ideas as far as was that a good timing or not. Was that two month period? Were you in a pretty secure area, or were, uh, uh, or was there such thing as a secure? Well, area? I, I think there was in in some places. Vung Tau was uh, it was pretty key as far as a supply area, of things coming from Saigon to Vung Tau and then out okay. primarily into the Mekong Delta. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had uh, I don't know, during the two months I was I was doing that that work. Uh, we probably had a maybe a dozen attacks, a dozen as far as uh, <laughs> rocket attacks or mortar attacks. Um, because also in Vung Town, not only the kind of the, the vessel stuff, but also there were, you know, uh, you know helicopter companies and stuff. Um, so then I received, uh, my next assignment was to actually be on the mic boats. And the ones that I kind of described how they were camouflaged, mm -hmm. they had a wooden hooch on the back that uh, would hold up to six people. And it was, you know, they were, they were uh, dented and damaged to the, all of that. And what our assignment was, was to take uh, supplies, in some case uh, uh, troops, down into the Mekong Delta. And that included, it could have been uh, things from Paps Blue Ribbon to uh, jet, or, or not jet fuel, but helicopter fuel, JP-4, in large bladders that would fill the well deck. Okay. Oh, kind of made of, of rubber, rubber bladders. Or it could be trucks, it could be uh, ammunition, it could be just about mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. that would fit into the well deck of, of our mic boat. 
and that was um, <laughs> that was probably the most impactful experience I've ever had as far as you know taking a boat with whatever supplies or personnel uh, down into the Mekong Delta which included a number of rivers yeah, and yeah. canals and, and we would uh, first of all the night boat is uh, you know it's a steel boat it's it's flat bottomed it's slow maybe 10 knots and slower when loaded with whatever yeah, yeah. I think they would hold about 60 tons that's its maximum and we usually travel in convoys of uh, anywhere from two to four boats, mainly for security reasons. Uh, and we would make our way down, well, the Mekong River, which in, in some parts was could be a mile wide, uh, or to smaller canals, depending on where we were providing those supplies to. And that was pretty much our home for, for the time I was on it. And that's where you really got close to the people you were mm. working with. Yeah, yeah. And it was, uh, um, it was, uh, you were kind of a sitting target because you were so big. So, yeah. and, and you were, and they, the Viet Cong, the, whoever happened to be down there that <laughs> didn't like you, uh, knew you were, you know, doing something. You were providing supplies to whether the infantry or, or probably more so to the, you know, to the, the helicopters. And, and uh, we also carried a, a, a weldex full of gravel because of some of the construction work on there. So a lot of different things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, that's when I really realized, uh, you know, we had had rocket mortar attacks, but this was more you know, directly at us, and uh, you know, just the uh, the climate down there at the time, it was very active down there as far as the Viet Cong. Uh, so from the uh, you know from the river banks or from the the sand pans that would be in the river. I mean, there was a lot of traffic down there. You didn't really know what was going on. So uh, we received a lot of, of fire, and we returned a lot. Uh, sometimes we would get in trouble and we'd have to call in the, the Cobra helicopters or, or uh, Navy uh, patrol boats. Uh, so, you know, we had help when we could get it. Uh, and uh, these trips would be overnight because it was quite a ways down there. And at night we would um, pretty much all get together and uh, kind of moor in the, the middle of the of the river, unless we were in a little canal or something, and you always had to be watchful. I mean, there, there were always a lot of um, uh, civilians uh, in sandpans. I mean, that's where they lived. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. They would come yeah. up alongside, and you know, selling bananas or, or whatever. Uh, so you were kind of always at risk, but uh, and always aware of that risk. Uh, I guess the other. Com, uh, comrades out there were, uh, which we, well, it was the Navy. I mean, they were very active with their, you know, swift boats or PBRs, or, or they had uh, larger uh, vessels that were larger than what the might boats were, and they were doing the same thing we were, only some of those were specifically there for protection. And that wasn't our, our role, yeah, even though right. we could protect ourselves. So I spent about six months doing that, and the best part of my, my lifetime education, <laughs> I guess. Uh, and uh, after that assignment, and I think it was because of my experience there and kind of knowing the river, then I was uh, assigned to a, uh, to, uh, I, the, the term was like harbor master. Uh, but it it wasn't really in a harbor, yeah. uh, and it was in a, a place in the delta, and it was called uh, Ven Long, was the name of the uh, kind of the village, and we had a uh, uh, maybe hut. It was maybe a little more than a hut that was right on the, the Mekong River. And we had kind of a screened-in porch, and, and our job there there were. Uh, uh, let's see, there were, I think, three of us there. 
and our uh, uh, mission there, I guess, was to to monitor the the traffic up and down the rivers, uh, as far as the uh, not only uh, I guess the army but the navy, or, uh, and we would uh, uh, not only harbor master but kind of the, the radio operator. So as the boats and other traffic, and it could be, there were a lot of uh, Filipino uh, tugboats that were, were there mm. and became very good friends and they were just the best people. Uh, but we were pretty much keeping track of what's coming down and are, were there any, any problems they had. And when they got closer, we didn't have piers or anything like that, maybe a little bit of a dock there and they would offload some of their things in Ven Long, but some of them would, would not stop there. They would continue down to the, to the uh, below the delta. But we kept track of, of where all those, all that traffic was. And when they needed help, we would, we would call in, you know, whether it's the Cobras or Hueys or okay. patrol boats, whatever, for protection there. But that was, uh, that was a, a great experience, too. I actually, uh, that's where I got the name Voice of the Delta. That was your nickname? Uh, that was my name. <laughs> uh, and it was uh, a neat experience, you know, talking on the radios with, with, uh, with a lot of different people, a lot of different nationalities, a lot of Koreans down there. Uh, you know, just learning that language of, of uh, you know, the radio and... Yeah, yeah. Uh, and providing help. A lot of it was very routine. In other words, I'm passing this checkpoint, okay, okay, and then they, they would call in as they passed certain villages or whatever. So we could kind of track their trip down the river. But also, uh, when they had supplies for us, uh, not, not for us personally, but there was a large uh, helicopter battalion that had the Hueys and the Chinooks and Cobras there. Uh, because it was uh, in a key area of the Delta to provide support for the artillery, for the infantry. Uh, so a very large uh, helicopter component there. So a lot of traffic coming down with fuel or ammunition or even special forces. Uh, uh, so we were there for a while and, um, and just being that close to the, uh, to the river. And we had, you know, high fences and all that, but um, we had a little bit of a pier we could walk out on, and, um, uh, you know, we, uh, that was a good vantage point, you know, with binoculars to see what's coming down the river, or um, actually to fish off the pier. Really, yeah. Occasionally. <laughs> uh, the, the other thing is that the sand pans would come to our pier to you know, sell watermelons or bananas or whatever, and we would do that because um, you know the, the the diet over there was not the greatest, or maybe the cuisine was the greatest. <laughs> but with the with the Mekong River, it was such a big river that uh, you know there was actually a tide there. So at high tide, it would be up next to the bottom of this pier, and it was just you know, the pier was only about this wide. But when it dropped, it would drop. Uh, I don't know, it could drop like 10 feet or so. So one thing that uh, always kind of, I don't know if it impressed me or depressed me, but, but that's where we would put all of our garbage in the river. Cause we were oh, is that right? Wow, yeah. And then uh, near us, because we were just on the river and there were these uh, villages around us and, and the, uh, once the, you know, the tide went out, you know, the scraps and all that were in the mud on the river there, the river bank. And the children of these villages would come there and that's what they would eat. Wow. And it was, uh, I don't know, it was just very striking yeah, as far yeah. as that was wow. concerned. Wow. Um, was, the, we, was the river different uh, during the monsoon season oh, yeah. compared to the dry season? And Yeah, well, just the velocity of the river, you could tell it, but the... But, uh, you know, the tide was what, because I didn't think that a river yeah. would be effective, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it was. Uh -huh. um, 
So I was there probably for about six months, and again... At, at that position? At, on the... Yeah, at that position oh. in Ven Long. Okay. And I, I guess I'll go back a little bit, but when I left Long Tao to get to Ben Long, the way I got there was on a, a civilian tugboat. Hmm. It was uh, actually a Vietnamese tugboat, but it was captained by, a, uh, by an American civilian. Hmm. And that trip uh, took a while because to get to Bung Tao to Ben Long, you have to actually go out in the South China Sea and then up the river. And that was a, a, quite an experience too because the life on the tugboat that type of tugboat was a little different than the life on the bike boat. Yeah, right. They, they lived a little better. I oh, think. really? Yeah. They did. They oh. did. Uh, uh, so sorry to digress. No, no, no. Yeah, uh, we'll make sure we catch capture all this. Yeah. But after the assignment in Vung Tao as I guess the harbor master there and all that we were involved in, uh, I was reassigned to another harbor master's office. In a uh, at a larger operation, uh, it wasn't quite so isolated, uh, but it was in a place called Ben Tui, which is very near a fairly uh, well-known Vietnamese city called Can Tho. But it was further down the the Mekong River, and our responsibilities there were pretty much the same, only it was a busier area. And that area was also, uh, we, were, we weren't in kind of the main compound, we were again out by the river, and it was a little bigger, uh, it's almost like a, a, a small building, like a mobile home or something. Uh, so the accommodations there were, the accommodations were a little better. I mean, we, we didn't have to, um, uh, well, on the boats, way we took showers, stand in the rain. That's why, uh, yeah, if you don't mind uh, digressing okay. back and, and talk about your living conditions in the various locations oh, and, okay. and food and, and okay. what you guys did when you weren't sure. on duty, and just to, uh, okay. what your daily life was like, I oh, guess. Okay. Yeah. Well, on the boats, we were always on duty. And what we did as far as um, food is concerned, it was primarily sea rations. And on occasion, and on a few occasions, up and down the river, our favorite thing to do was to come alongside the Navy, they were called reefer barges, because of the, the temperature, not because of something else. <laughs> uh, and they always had the best food. I mean, the Navy, except maybe those on PBRs and stuff like that, were they had the good life as far as food. and. The, the people on the barge, the Navy personnel, they were always welcoming Not because really. they knew what we were going through. Because we were, uh, you know, we weren't in uniforms or anything. We had cutoffs and we had a t-shirt and a flak jacket and usually had, usually had a helmet on, but not always. So they were always glad to feed us and we were glad to be there because the sea rations got a little old. And we also did, uh, you know, buy food from, you know, the, the other folks on the river, the sampans and the, the mamasans and all that. Was there, I mean, this whole time, I, I get the impression that you, you never knew who was who. No. And you always had your, uh, on your on your guard. I mean, yeah. you could never let that down. And how did you release that pressure? It seems like you're, you're constantly, you just can't let... What? Well, yeah, I guess you just had to. You hmm. just had to... Uh, not be afraid of everything. Hmm. And, and I think after a while you, in some way you could kind of know that. I, I mean, use your best judgment, but, but you always were on your toes on the boats because you, did, you never knew when something would happen. Yeah, oh, geez. Uh, but we, uh, uh, there were six of us usually on one boat and, and again in a kind of a man-made hooch on the back of the boat and there were uh, two sets of three bunks, I guess you could say. Uh, and it was wooden because, uh, you know, some of the, there were some kind of metal structures there. But if you ever took any rounds, that would, uh, the wood would absorb that better than ricochet all over the place. Mm, but, uh, okay. uh, 
so that the life on the river was very different. Uh, you know, we be a long time in between showers, and we would actually stand in the rain sometime, oh, or we would, uh, you know, get in the water. Uh, but a, a very stark life on the river. Uh, and when I was at the first uh, kind of harbor master assignment in Vin Long, it was pretty much a, kind of a small shack that was constructed. I think there were there were three rooms. Uh, because three people and there was a bunk in there, but you know, it was much of a place. <laughs> we would uh, take a shower out back with, uh, there was a 55 gallon drum of water and uh, so we would take a shower when we needed to. But, uh, and the food there was uh, some sea rations that we would get, but also uh, since there was a base nearby, not real close, sometimes we would actually drive in uh, while there's still somebody left behind, uh, maybe if you know they had somewhat of a, uh, a mess hall, I guess, uh, or we would again get food from the, the people coming down. Uh, sometimes they would give us beer or whatever, but, uh, but pretty meager life there too. Mm. And this, um, the same way in the next assignment only, it was a little closer to I guess civilization. If you could call it that. So. <laughs> now, during this time, did you ever get pulled back for some R and R? I mean, we were... uh, yes. Uh, after it was probably almost a year, then uh, I got I think a two two week leave for R and R, and had the good fortune of being over there during the time of Expo '70 in Osaka, Japan, and that was one of the choices. It was Australia, Thailand going back home, Let's see, I think that was an option, or going to Expo Center. So I did that oh, wow. and thoroughly enjoyed that, to go to a World's Fair, yeah, which yeah. was amazing. Uh, so that was a nice break. It was uh, a little unusual because of the reception that uh, the GIs received in Japan, because there was you know, a number that went back. And the first thing you did was, you know, get rid of your fatigues and you would go, uh, they had places where you go to, you know, uh, lo they would loan you clothes. Mm. And, and once you were at Expo 70, you know, a lot of people there, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of people. But they knew that you were a serviceman, maybe because they were, and they, would come up to you and ask you for an autograph or something. Really? Oh, yeah, wow. And that, that was kind of my, my reaction as well. Was, really? Well, yeah, as you were but, uh, first yeah, mentioned, I it thought was, it was, oh, it was wow. kind of well, welcoming, I guess. And, and oh, primarily, you know, the Japanese were and very friendly and, and very hospitable. So that was, that was a good experience, uh, except the part about going back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but th but that it was R and R and I and it was great. It really was. So. Hmm. What was it tough? I mean, you're, you're talking about living basically on the edge of, of yeah. civilization, going into a modern, oh, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> literally a six hour flight or a four hour flight. You're in a sure. different environment. A different environment. Yeah. And not only that, but it was a different environment what I was used to in in yeah. the small town. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Colorado. Right. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it was. Pretty much orchestrated. I mean, they, you know, they didn't just put you out there alone. I mean, there were, you know, tours, and but it was a great experience for mm. sure. And how was it as far as um, getting word and uh, word from home, oh, letters, okay. sure. uh, uh, just news, just okay. communications from home? What was that like, uh, or uh, how was that? Oh, okay. Well, I, uh, except when I, well, even when I was on the boat, because we would eventually get back to kind of the headquarters part and, and receive mail. And I would also write letters, and primarily to my mom and to my sister. Mm -hmm. And I even had the, and I'm not sure how I did this, but I actually uh, had, had pictures. I would send them. I don't know if that was a Polaroid or what, but that we were, I did do some of that. But, but that was always the high point is, you know, kind of the mail call, whether you've been out for two or three months or whatever, or 
um, you were in a more permanent position, uh, a place. Yeah, yeah, and right. You would receive mail more, more often, but it was always great to, to receive the mail. Uh, so that was one way. Uh, there was certainly no cell phones or a text email or, or yeah, right, yeah. Tweet instant, or yeah. Like that. yeah. And there was a armed forces radio, and didn't you know pick up that a lot at all. And I think there was some type of a, you know, printed thing, but, you know, that was mainly, you know, people around Saigon or the larger bases. So, uh, but hearing news from home was, was you know, one way. Yeah, to do yeah. That. Was there, uh, you know, as we know, there was, it was a divided country back here yes. in regards to the yes. war and, and the protests and such. Were you guys aware of that? Yes. And, and how did that play on your mind or affect you guys? Or what were your thoughts at well, um, it was pretty much what you might expect. We were that made us not feel not feel good, yeah. not, and like not appreciated, yeah, or, yeah, or not understood. So that was the main reaction to that, I think, because I had also had because I was over there for nineteen months, had an opportunity to come home for a short leave and then go back, and that's when it really kind of came home to me. Um, you know, personally, as far as the reaction, I mean, certainly family and friends yeah, were right. very supportive, but, right. you know, flying into San Francisco. Yeah, I've heard like the that. horror stories of that. And I, no one ever spat on me or yeah. anything like that, but uh, when you traveled, uh, when you were in the military, you, know, you were required to wear a uniform and then your flights were free. But, but um, what I would do is I would always, once I was on the plane, I would change hmm. into more civilian type of clothing because of the reactions you would get in the airports and stuff. So hmm. that was, but once, you know, at home with friends and family, it was quite different. Now you said you were in country 19 months. That, that seems, from what I understand, a pretty long assignment. Was it was it two assignments or did you re-opt or how did, how did it end up the... Well, I, uh, I, uh, because the normal assignment is one year, right, right. And then I volunteered for another six months so I could get out earlier than my three-year assignment. Oh, okay. And it turned out that was only about maybe six or eight weeks earlier. But, uh, oh, really? <laughs> I'm sure it was worth it. But, <laughs> but yeah, that's, uh, I had done that to, uh, not because I was really enjoying it. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Because I would get out earlier. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it, um, as far as the, the third assignment in uh, the, the Harbor Master's office, and that was, uh, uh, again, you know, much busier than the other places, still kind of the same type of assignment, but, uh, uh, but a little more uh, like what you would see in the States, except for, you know, we would be, uh, you know, under attack sometime, but less frequent. You know? Oh, jeez. Uh, but it was more like being on an army base in the U.S., except for where we were actually located, because we weren't on an army base. But we did have the ability to go in and, uh, you know, the cafeteria or something like that if we need our, our medical attention. So a little perhaps a little more secure, a little more normal, but still a little bit on, on edge. Yeah. And we, because of the traffic in and out of that, uh, that harbor, it wasn't a harbor, it's just, you know, again, on the river, but a lot more types of activities. Uh, one of my favorite things there was, we had a Filipino tug that kind of serviced the area, moving barges around, it was called Pinhead. And uh, it was Filipino crew and just the best, best people. So it became very, very close friends with them. Oh, wow. Uh, so that was really neat. But we had to come to their aid a lot of times because they were, you know, out there in the river and they're seeing things. And, uh, uh, you know, when you park a lot of stuff out in the river, barges and stuff, there's always people kind of wanting that stuff, and, you know, whether it's beer or ammunition or mm -hmm. whatever. So, yeah. Um, I forgot what I was going to ask you here. Um, 
Boy, I, 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 drew, I had, a question, had a question going here and I, 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 I've lost it. Uh, boy, I think we need to move on. Oh, I get, no, that's okay. Yeah, sure. yeah I, uh, I had something on my, on my uh, tip of my tongue and I, I forgot what it was now. But uh, Well, I, I know what it was. Okay. What would you do uh, uh, for entertainment when you weren't on duty? Oh. I mean, I'm not uh, sure it varied in the three different situations. Yeah, right? well, uh, actually the first two situations there wasn't much entertainment. In the uh, the third assignment in Bintui, there was there was uh, uh, actually a bigger base there, so they not necessarily the USO, but sometimes they had people come in. Oh wow! Uh -huh. And the uh, like one would be Denny McLean, who played for the Detroit Tigers, you know, the first thirty game winner or whatever. Or, and there were a few other things like that. And we also, uh, since we were near Kanto, which was a larger city, not anywhere close to being as big as Saigon, but we could actually go into town. Uh, so that was, a, I guess, a form of entertainment too, is just getting away from the base. Mm -hmm. But that's really the only time we could, um, with the exception of in Vung Tao, the first assignment, we could do that a few times, but not as, not so much. Okay. Um, so there was some of that, but it was mainly work and you know camaraderie with people, whether they were, you know, uh, in the army or the navy, or they were Filipinos or Koreans or so. That yeah. Was, yeah. yeah. So uh, you come to the end of your tour, uh, take yeah. your story from there. It must. Oh, uh, okay. What was it? What was the feeling like when you got on that plane to? To leave, or was it? Well, it was different than when we originally landed. Mm -hmm. When we landed, it was silent, very silent. Yeah, yeah. When we took off, it was just the opposite. Wow. People were going crazy. Wow. Going back to the world, as yeah. I said. In uh, my assignment, uh, when I left Vietnam, was to go back to Fort Eustis for, and I was there, let's see, for March, probably five months. Um, until my uh, until I left the service, and our back to Fort Eustis, and what we did there were trained students coming in. In other words, we were we were operating the boats, teaching the, the new students on how to um, navigate, how to how to operate the boats, uh, not only the mic boats but tug boats, and that was. Uh, that was kind of nice. It was a little different environment. Again, uh, where Fort Eustis is, is located uh, in Hampton Roads, uh, Williamsburg's nearby Jamestown, a lot of history there. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot more flexibility as far as what we did when we weren't working. And there was a lot to see in that area, a lot to do. And uh, even some of the people I was with in Vietnam were, were reassigned back there. So oh, good. Then, uh, while I never was with them in Vietnam, but coming back was, we had lots of stories. To tell. Well, now, once again, you know, kind of relating that to your trip up to Japan, yes. uh, you're, you're on a flight, you're, you're in the thick of Vietnam, yeah. and 12 hours later, you're in the United States. It wasn't like in World War II where the guys got on a, on a ship and had yeah. six weeks to kind of, or a couple of weeks to acclimate back to, right. to the states of civilization. I mean, you were literally back there. Was, right. that, was that much of an adjustment? Oh, and, big time. Yeah. Big time. And it was not a 12 hour, it was more like 24 hours. 24 hours. <laughs> oh, maybe geez. a little more. Than yeah. That. Uh, yeah, that was an adjustment. And I think what helped a little bit was to go back to an army base. Ah, uh, okay. Uh -huh. And it was, it would have been different, I think, to go back home mm -hmm. because it was somewhat of a transition period. Uh, still in the army, still around yeah, yeah. that, maybe that amount of discipline, still around people that understand what you've been through and understand that. But, but also the ability to leave the base and go into town okay. or the city or go to Williamsburg or Jamestown or somewhere like that. Uh, in civilian clothes, mm -hmm. even though your hair is still pretty short. <laughs> but that was a, probably a good transition, and uh, which was good. And I think I actually had my car out there. I can't remember how I got my car out there. 
but we were able to feel a little more like civilians and uh, you know, enjoy. I had an uncle that lived up in Pennsylvania, and I was able to go up and visit him and go through uh, you know D.C. and play tourist up there and stuff. So that was that was all good. Uh, and then I was released from service in November of '71. Then I went back to uh, back to around Western Colorado. Uh, I went to school at, at the time it was Mesa Junior College and received my associates in business. And you know, being a student, being a little older student, non-traditional student, uh, a little bit of transition situations there, but nothing, I mean, my hair was getting long. <laughs> uh, so I, I did go to Mesa Junior College and I graduated there and then went to Colorado State here in Fort Collins and you know all the time using my GI Bill oh, which at the time I think it was about 65 or 75 a month you know worked part time but did really well in school uh, back to Fort Collins uh, graduated from CSU in 75 and then started my work career in Minneapolis and then back to Fort Collins uh, with HP for 26 years, Please. and at that, uh, while I was at HP, got my master's degree from CSU, and but but a great career at Hewlett Packard, and, and more recently, uh, you know, three years with the federal government. Um, so and so, that's kind of the story. Wonderful. Now retired as uh, about a month and a half. Oh, congratulations. So another chapter. <laughs> and would be very interested in going back to Vietnam. Really? Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, especially in the, in the Delta area, uh, Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City now, which would take a bit of adjustment. But uh, certainly have a, have a desire to go back and probably will some point in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of maybe not relive those things, but. Do you think Let's it'll give you different. give you some closure? Is there, is there any closure issues, or just just, no, I, just I more of interest? It, yeah, more of an interest yeah. than closure, because I think I did the closure thing, and, uh, and at least in my opinion, pretty well adjusted now. <laughs> that was going to be my next question, and how you know we've talked about it. it's now been able to diagnose oh, the, the, yeah. the PTSD and 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 oh, such. Yeah, any issues with that at all? No, or? not at all. Yeah. Uh, there may have been some issues with Agent Orange because a lot of that was really? down oh, in the boy. area. I did go through a, kind of an evaluation down in uh, Albuquerque at a, a hospital there. They sent a lot of uh, people that were in Vietnam in that area during cer certain periods of time. You know, nothing. Oh, good. Wonderful. Know, not that, ne was there ever any issues with any of uh, the diseases and stuff associated with that climate down there? Uh, uh, not. Not so much. I think the only thing that was fairly serious, other than getting shot at, it, was, was uh, I had a very impacted wisdom tooth, and they had to take me to a field hospital to have it extracted, but with no painkillers. Oh. Because they were using those for something. <laughs> so so uh, that was, but you don't get a Purple Heart for this. <laughs> The, no, no, nothing, uh, nothing mental or, f or physical that, that I'm aware of. <laughs> yeah, no, one might want to ask my wife. I think I'm good. <laughs> well, that, I, I, that's a question too. I don't know if you knew her, but but uh, maybe more so your your sister and your mother. Yes. Did they, did they see a different person that went and came back or? Um, well, very close to my sister. Sure, I, I wrote her a lot of letters and. I would actually send her money so she could keep it until I came back. And um, I'm, not, I'm sure Ruth will see this. And we've always had this little thing about what she did with the money. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> she still owes me is all I can say. <laughs> but, uh, so as far as a changed person, then when I left, when I was 18 or 19 and went to basic training, yeah, very different person. Uh, and that was, uh, I guess, the overall experience. 
that's what was most value, valuable to me, is by the time I was 19, I think I was pretty, pretty mature and kind of knew what I was doing. Uh, and the experiences were just invaluable. Mm, wow. and, uh, invaluable. Well, that's kind of, uh, that, that's usually my last question when I do these interviews yes. is how, how do you think that time period changed, changed your life, affected your life, played a role in your life, or was it just a chapter in your life? And I think oh, you pretty much expounded yeah, on that. Transformed yeah. be done. into a college student, from a college student that maybe didn't have the direction that I needed in this. To so you could definitely see that at UNC and then at, at Mesa Junior, the difference. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Didn't mean I wasn't partying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There yeah. was a lot of that. Yeah, so, yeah. But a little different direction, yeah, more guided. Yeah. So, and it was good. Thing. Through the years, have you kept in touch with some of the guys you served with over there or any sort of reunions or anything uh, like that? I know you moved around. Really, yeah, yeah. Not, not really. There's been a few that, um, that were in Vietnam that I was with that I met subsequently. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, you know, whether at school or, mm -hmm. or in a job mm -hmm. or something, and, and stayed in touch with them because we have such right, right. commonality and experience. Right. And, right. Um, but as far as being retired now, I, I certainly want to give back and I want to do something that helps veterans now. Uh, so. You know, that's, that, I guess that's another impression that I've had is the, the sacrifices that veterans make and some come back in different conditions than I did. And, yeah, yeah. And both mentally and physically. So. Well, what are your thoughts now uh, from the time you were serving yes. and through the years as the war has been oh. talked about, digested and, and, right. and debated, what are your what are your feelings then and now as far as the Vietnam War in general? Just well, just in preparing for this, I read a lot more, and because it's always been kind of in the back of my mind, I don't talk about it a lot. And, and so why do you think that is? Would you say any idea why? Well, you... uh, well, I think it's just just moving on. Okay. And uh, you know, putting not hiding those things, right, but right. just you know being. You know, in, in a different place, and, mm -hmm. you know, working and raising a family, mm -hmm. and so I, I think I don't dwell on it. Okay, you know? it, it's it's kind of a nice thing to go back and rethink it, and that's what's what's been you know very much appreciated as far as this process, because I have gone back and and you know dug out things and researched things, and and it really brings that back to you and. But you can't dwell on the past. Yeah, and yeah. Still got to keep moving. That's what I've done. Yeah, yeah. I think been at least relatively successful as far as you know, kind of focusing on different things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do. Uh, I understand how why it may impact people differently because of the experiences they've had, maybe because of what they came to the service with in the first place. Um, and, and in my experience, I saw a lot of the way people treat people, um, in both good and bad, mm -hmm. a lot of really good things, but a lot of bad things mm -hmm. as well, as far as, you know, how people were treated, not, I'm not just talking about the, the Americans, but other, mm -hmm. so, but I also see the, you know, the, the good things, the kindness, uh, the camaraderie again, not only with your your comrades, but also the the people of Vietnam, and and there's really a lot of good there. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, uh, getting kind of back to my earlier question, what are you, what are your thoughts on, on the actual war itself oh, okay. and, and and our role in it, uh, the purpose of it? I mean, then okay. and now, as we've as time okay. has passed, I right. guess. Right, as far as the Vietnam. Yeah, yeah generally. Yeah, yeah generally. well, it was. Probably the first war like that that mm -hmm. we've engaged in, mm -hmm. and I think there was a lot more political uh, aspects of that than mm -hmm. maybe uh, prior wars. So I think in, in certain situations our hands were kind of tied uh, as far as what we could do, what we couldn't do, and the inconsistencies in that 
type of policy and also just the type of war that was fought as far as, you know, you can't really recognize who your enemy is and they fight in a totally different way than maybe they did in Korea or World War One or Two mm -hmm. or the Revolutionary yeah, War. Yeah. And I think that was the first war where we really had that type of uh, obstacles or that type of uh, challenges. Uh, and I saw that a lot, uh, when, especially in the, the Mekong Delta, because you didn't see a lot of North Vietnamese troops down there. You didn't see them, they may have been there, but, yeah. but that wasn't our biggest issue. I and mean, it was you know, the people that blended in. Right, right. Oh, boy. Yeah, that wow. Was, yeah, but right. I think we're seeing more wars like that now, obviously, with, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan mm -hmm. or wherever. Yeah. But I, I still go back to um, the, uh, the, the honor and the appreciation that I have for people that do that. Because um, it, it, it's a big sacrifice and it's a lot of times really thankless. And there's not as much. I think now there's more support for veterans, which, which anytime I see a veteran in the airport or whatever, I go up and shake their hand. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, and and thank them for what they're doing. I don't know who they are. But I'll thank them for wearing the uniforms. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's. Uh, uh, we talked a little about career. Talk a little bit about family. Okay. Great, yeah. Great family. That's my number one priority for sure. Uh, my wife, uh, we've been married 32 years now, and we met in Minneapolis when, after I graduated from CSU, so we met there and uh, moved back here in 79. She's a wonderful person, very supportive, uh, especially when I'm in retirement. <laughs> uh, she uh, works at, at HP and uh, you know, very busy, very, very loving and caring, dedicated, and and in retirement, I'm working, still working on the A list, which is Anne's list. <laughs> uh, but by by two children are are wonderful. It's it's the I guess the contribution of my life. <laughs> uh, my daughter Jessica, who's 25, and just the she, when I ask how things are going, she says she's living the dream. Oh, so wow. she's really a, just a socialite, just the, you know, the most wonderful person, outgoing person. Um, she's a mental health counselor uh, here in Fort Collins. And my son, Sean, who's 22, he's a, an honor student at, at CSU. And uh, he's six foot four. So he's a big guy. Uh, and just a great student, a great, a great friend as well. So I uh, enjoy the kids very much. No grandkids yet, so they're both single. Uh, and my extended family, um, you know, wonderful people. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful people. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, Dave, we'll start to wind down this interview. Sure. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about, or any stories that have floated to the top if we, as we've been yeah. talking here, that, that, so that hopefully we, we've capped your story yes. as best we can, or do you think we've pretty much captured it all? Well, the only question that I wanted you to ask was one you forgot to ask. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I can't think of anything else. I certainly appreciate this opportunity because it's really, uh, first of all, I appreciate you for oh, doing honor, what you do. Oh, honor's all mine, absolutely. No, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's nice, for sure, but uh, it, it was good for me to kind of relive what happened, again, dig out some things, and, you know, some memories, uh, and uh, just recall that as far as how different it is than just sitting around this subdivision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and some things that I experienced, uh, you know, a lot of people never experience those kind of things, and and it kind of makes other things seem kind of not not mundane because yeah. obviously just living is yeah, right. Yeah, you know, bet. is great and uh, keeps you busy. But you know, all that stuff tucked away, you know, almost forty years ago. It's like sometimes it just seems like a movie or something. Hmm. Or a dream, or did I really do that wow. kind of stuff? 
as, as you've watched various uh, Vietnam movie theme the theme oh. movies, uh, does that bring up any uh, oh. thoughts? Sure. And, and are, are they done well? I mean, do they capture the? Well, you know, I think I want to go back and revisit some of those. Yeah. I know, uh, you know, like a Good Morning Vietnam, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, Robin Williams. Mm -hmm. That was well, certainly that was more in. It wasn't out in the boom right, or yeah, whatever. Right. But there have been a few, like a couple it's now. I think there was actually some river boats stuff on that. And uh, let's we'll see what was. Uh, well, there's been a fair number of them. I think I've seen most of them. But I may want to go back and take another look. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, the deer hunter was one. But yeah. yeah. So, uh, and I'm, you know, a lot of that's realistic, and obviously some of it isn't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just saw one, one bit of that, too. Yeah, right, sure. right, sure. Yeah. Well, then, uh, if there's anything else, uh, I, I want to thank you for sitting down to tell your well, story, but you. more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, th this is looking at uh, the map of the region, the surrounding countries of, of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, when I was stationed in Vietnam, uh, I first flew into Cameron Bay. That's where they bring a lot of uh, new, uh, new recruits in. Mm -hmm. And we flew from there into what is now called Ho Chi Minh City. At the time it was uh, Saigon there for uh, for some processing and then stationed for for a while in Vung Tau which is right on the South China Sea as you can see Vietnam is is bordered by Cambodia and Laos mm -hmm. and once I finished my or my duty in Vung Tau then I was transferred down into the Mekong River Delta area where I spent the, the balance of my, uh, my assignment in Vietnam. Okay, uh, taking a closer look at the area where we operated our mic boats was down in the, the Delta, Mekong Delta area. Mm -hmm. And Saigon was located up here. And a lot of our uh, traffic down there, we would take many of the, the rivers and the canals down into the uh, the Delta, uh, bringing on our boats, uh, where it could be uh, ammunition or fuel for the helicopters, JP-4. Uh, it could be food, it could be troops, but we spent a lot of time on the many canals and rivers of the Mekong Delta, supplying areas, uh, whether they're infantry or helicopter, uh, battalions down uh, down in various areas of the canals and rivers in, in the Delta area. Well, I imagine each each mission was was scary, but I can't imagine with these these open top boats carrying uh, fuel or ammunition. You were just basically riding on a powder keg, pretty much, weren't you? Uh, yes, pretty much. Uh, the the boat that we we operated had a large well deck. And in that well deck is where we would have the supplies, uh, particularly a JP-4 was uh, the helicopter fuel and that was stored in large rubber mm -hmm. bladders and it always made a, a nice target. Oh, jeez. <laughs> okay, my uh, basic training uh, was done in Fort Lewis, Washington. This was back in... Uh, March of 1969. This is a picture of the platoon that I served in, uh, again in Fort Lewis, Washington. Uh, when we were there, the weather was really cold, and I always wondered why we were training there to go to Vietnam. Yeah. Totally different climate. Uh, this is my picture here. That's you right there? That's me okay. under that uh, crease. And a lot of those people, when I look at this picture, brings back great memories, oh, wow. a tough time that we all went through together. Hmm. Uh, following my basic training, I went to Fort Eustis, Virginia for my advanced training. 
and somewhat surprising to me, my assignment was to learn how to operate uh, what we referred to as mic boats. Uh, yes, the Army had, uh, had vessels. This was, my training included learning to be a crew member and also an operator of the uh, LCMs, our, our mic boats as we referred to them. It was a vessel similar to what you maybe saw in pictures of World War II with the landing craft hitting the beach, dropping the ramp, and letting troops off or whatever. Uh, these are certainly newer than those and larger, more powerful, and they held more. They were 75 foot long, about 30 foot across, and had a well deck that held uh, all kinds of different things could be a tank or trucks or ammunition, uh, anything that would fit troops and had two large, or actually four large uh, diesel engines that, that powered it, flat bottom boat. Probably the top speed empty was maybe 11 knots. Mm. Okay, my uh, first assignment in uh, Vietnam was in a location, uh, the, the closest town was called Vân Tau on the South China Sea. And the assignment we had at that point in time was to actually paint the LCMs or the mic boats and turn those over to the Vietnamese. So here I am with my paintbrush in the well deck of a, a mic boat. Uh, here's another picture of, of that assignment to uh, paint the mic boats, turn those over to the Vietnamese so they can start uh, uh, doing the work that we had done previous to that. Uh, so here's one with its ramp down and me busy at work. Uh, one thing about my assignment in Vung Tau, it was known as the, the French Riviera, Riviera of Vietnam. But as you can see, there is a beautiful beach, but it's somewhat marred by the, uh, the concertina wire and the razor wire that uh, pretty much kept us away from enjoying the beach. Okay, my second assignment, this was after spending about two months painting mic boats. Well, things seem to have taken a turn where we we stopped that process and we were back on the mic boats and using them for providing supplies and support to the U.S. forces, the Australian forces, Korean forces down in the Mekong Delta uh, in South Vietnam. So my next assignment was to be the, uh, of what we call the coxswain or the operator of a mic boat. And this is a picture of what, uh, what that looked like. As you can see, it wasn't a nice gray color. It was a camouflage color with, uh, with a homemade wooden hooch on the back of the boat. And on both sides of the boat, you probably can't see it here, but we had uh, one uh, 50 caliber machine gun on both sides. And on top, there was an M60 machine gun and the crew itself was well armed with uh, whatever we could scavenge, whether that would be, uh, well, the, the weapon we were issued was an M16, but we always carried a, somewhat of an arsenal of things that we'd gather together, such as uh, M79 grenade launchers, uh, M14 rifles, uh, submachine guns, and you name it, whatever we could collect that would uh, provide protection as we went up and down the Mekong River carrying uh, various goods, uh, whether that be uh, ammunition or beer or uh, JP-4 fuel for the helicopters, just about anything that would fit in the boat. Hmm. Here's another picture of, of what the mic boats looked like while I was serving on those. And this is a picture of three of them alongside each other. And that's not me laying out on the, the deck of the, the first one there, but this is uh, pretty much what uh, they look like. We were proud to, to fly the American flag. And you can, from this picture, you can kind of get the scale of the river, of the Mekong. At some places, it was as much as a, a mile wide. 
and you can see in the distance there's a Vietnamese sand pan. This, a lot of the civilian traffic was by boat, and it's kind of unusual to only see one of them in this picture, but it must have been a slow day for them. Hmm. Okay, uh, as you can imagine, uh, the boats that we were on, they were they were big and they were slow, and the 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 supplies we were carrying were always of interest to not only our troops but also the Viet Cong or others. And while we were pretty well armed on the Mike boats, often we needed to, I guess, call reinforcements. And we saw a lot of um, the Navy, and in this case, uh, a Navy. Uh, PBR or patrol boat river as they referred to. They were a lot faster, a lot better armed, and they were always a welcome sight when we needed them. Okay, well, when we couldn't get the help we needed from the, from the water, we often had to call in uh, air support. And in this picture, it's really there for a couple of reasons. One is to show you the the Cobras, the helicopter that was called the Cobra that uh, often was pretty active down in, in that area. But this was also to show you a picture of, in the foreground you'll see a, a, a tanker, and that tanker is on the well deck of a mic boat. So we have uh, beached the mic boat, dropped the ramp, and we have a, a, tra a tanker there that has uh, helicopter fuel in it. So we are providing, well, we're helping them help us, I guess, <laughs> but we're uh, providing fuel for the helicopters. And the barrels that you see in the fore uh, foreground are really protection for the helicopters because they would land in between those. And if there was any uh, rocket fire or whatever, that would sometimes take the impact of that. Uh, following my assignment on the Mike boats, I was assigned to a different position but within the same uh, company. And that was to be, well, the, uh, I guess the position was a harbor master. And we were located in another small village down in the Mekong River it's called Vin Long. And this, uh, this building, uh, was where our office was, and we were located right on the river. You can see the river right in the, the fore, foreground. Uh, in front, you can also see the, uh, the, 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 the fences that were there for protection. And the, uh, the water tank that you see on the left is actually where we got our, our drinking water as well as that's what we used for showering and other purposes. Uh, my assignment there was to monitor river traffic up and down the Mekong River, uh, not only for U.S. forces, boats, uh, tugboats, uh, barges, and so forth, but uh, Navy and as well as maybe Korean, Filipino traffic. So we kept track of, of their positions as they would Pass certain checkpoints along the along their journey, and provide them with uh, with assistance when they needed. Often that was uh, calling in a helicopter or maybe a patrol boat assistance to them if they needed it. Uh, so I was on the radio a lot, monitoring that traffic. Some of it was pretty uh, routine, but other times it got a little. Uh, a little interesting, and that's where I acquired, the, I guess, the nickna nickname up and down the Mekong is the voice of the Delta. <laughs> okay, still at the assignment in Vin Long uh, as the harbor master, uh, the food that we had given to us by the Army was not always that great, a lot of sea rations and things like that, so we supplemented our diet by the the uh, I guess the merchandise on the river and here's a picture of a, a mama san with uh, bananas I think uh, watermelons and other things that we used to 
supplement our menu on uh, sea rations, I guess. So that, she was always a welcome sight once we got to know her. And in this picture, you can also see the the width of the Mekong at this particular place. You can also see off to the right, up towards the top, there's a couple of barges that have been brought in from probably from Saigon, uh, and they use, uh, on these two particular barges, there's gravel that they use for construction projects in, in this area. And that's that little pier you were talking about? That you, yes, okay. that's right. Okay, here's another picture of the little pier off our I guess the Hovermaster shack. And as you can see, the traffic is pretty limited right now, so I did take advantage of that opportunity to see how big the fish were in the Mekong Delta. Okay, my third assignment in Vietnam was uh, related to my duties at the Ven Long uh, operation. But it was uh, a little bit of a promotion, I guess, because it was a bigger operation in, uh, uh, as far as Harbor Master is concerned. And this is located in, in Ben Tui, Vietnam, which is further down the, the Mekong River. And a little more activity at this uh, port, a lot, more, a lot more traffic. And with it, there was a fair amount of more responsibility as far as monitoring that traffic, not only coming in and out, but while it was there at the location. We had the assistance of moving things around in the harbor from uh, a Filipino tugboat that we grew very fond of as far as the, the, the work that they did and the people that they were. Uh, really a great crew of three or four Filipinos. Uh, the name of the tug was Pinhead and we had lots of good conversations, both serious and and not so serious. Mm -hmm. Okay, still at the uh, Bentui Harbor Master's office. These are a couple of my really good friends that helped out there. Uh, the one on the right, he probably just out of the shower and back underneath the 55 gallon drum. And then our Mama San, who would provide, uh, uh, when we were on the boats, Pretty much what we wore were cutoffs, a t-shirt and a flak jacket. But in this position, we, as you can see, had fatigues on. So she uh, did the laundry for that and also occasionally fixed us a meal or so, but a really a, a wonderful person. And the guy on the right, his name was Washington and uh, just a, a great friend there and a lot of help, uh, both in the good times and the bad times. And, and in the back, while we pretty much lived uh, there by the beach, occasionally we went into the, the army base that was located in Bentui, where it was a little more like a, a, an army base stateside, except uh, uh, it did receive a few mortars and rockets, but that was our transportation back and forth when we needed it. Okay, one uh, highlight of the, uh, the tour of Vietnam was the ability to take an R&R, &R, or rest and recuperation uh, leave for a couple of weeks after being over there for about a year. And I had the, uh, I guess, the good fortune of being over there during the time that Expo 70 was happening in Osaka, Japan. So I did take advantage of that and spent uh, probably a little over a week in Osaka uh, touring the, the, the wonderful exhibit that was there during that, that time. This was one of the uh, main attractions. I wish I could remember the name of the exhibit, but it was kind of the, the trademark for, the, for Expo 70. Okay, another exhibit at the uh, Expo 70 that kind of caught my attention was the one for the Soviet Union. It was an immense structure, but what really caught my attention with this is the, the young Japanese girl in the foreground with her red skirt and colorful yellow hat looking up at this uh, monstrosity of the Soviet <laughs> Union. Uh, one other thing about being at Expo 70 that was remarkable to me is is being there and when we first got there we obviously uh, 
uh, exchanged our fatigues that we used in war in Vietnam to more civilian-like clothes. And as we mingled with the many, many people that were at the uh, at Expo 70, we would often have the, the Japanese come up and ask us for our autograph and also thank us for what we were doing mm -hmm. in their own language. Okay, I just uh, had to show you this picture again at Expo 70, and that's the space capsule. Uh, when I left for Vietnam, it was in August of 69, and that just happened to be the same date, month, and year that we landed on the moon. Uh, this isn't, you know, I don't, I don't think this was the space capsule, but it was but one of the, the ones that was used in maybe earlier flights. So that was quite, a, quite an attention getter. And there was another uh, display of the lunar lander, and I think it may have been a model, not the real one. Mm. Okay, this is a picture of uh, happier times uh, after leaving Vietnam and coming back to the world, as we called it. This was uh, taken in Fort Eustace, which I was assigned to Fort Eustis for another four months, uh, training students on how to operate the mic boats and tugboats and all of that. And I was there for another, well, in Fort Eustis for, say, four months before I left the service. But these are just some of my com comrades at Fort Eustis uh, having a good time. I saw a few of these people I knew in Vietnam but uh, at different times, and so I just wanted to share that. Very I'm good. the one in the blue and white stripes. Okay, very good.